please welcome the director of Rolling Thunder Review, Martin Scorsese. <laughs> oh man, I got to watch the last 15 minutes. Oh, oh man, it looks great. good on the screen, doesn't it? Yeah, I know, because the music is the thing, so I, <laughs> I'm watching them up there. Wow. Yeah. Well, we're going to ask you some questions about Please. Tracks, but we're also talking about your entire career oh. as a non-fiction <laughs> filmmaker, so we're going to I'm going to ask you a few origin questions first. Um, starting with, um, you've talked about, and even in the clips program that we saw, about um, how formative film was for you. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the nonfiction aspect of that. Maybe early documentary films that you saw either in the movie theater or on your um, 16-inch RCA television at home. Yeah, the, uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, most of the early uh, years that I, uh, I, I was viewing films, they took me to movie theater all the time, uh, were, were narrative films, uh, supposedly narrative fiction films. Um, and the sense of um, nonfiction sort of slipped in slowly in the, in the late 40s, early 50s. I think the kind Really, something happened. Um, again, it's a whole thing about me having asthma in 1946. I wasn't allowed to uh, play sports or um, to run around or uh, be near animals of any kind and any trees. And I was allergic to everything. You know, it was very, very bad. And also, no, I was saying today, no laughing because kids would get into a spasmodic laughter and they just uh, turn blue and, you know. It was very bad, and, then, and so I was always taken to the movie theaters, and I saw, um, I think the closest thing I can think of that was overlapping a little bit into uh, nonfiction were the film noirs, really, because at that time there weren't noirs, it was the movies you went to see, they were there, um, the westerns, I like, but I think what happened is that, and this is slightly, um, could be misunderstood because uh, one thinks of, uh, there's a, there's a whole thing that goes back to the 40s and 50s and early 60s. If it's black and white and grainy, that means it's real. <laughs> and that comes from newsreels. You say, now with the younger people today, of course, the perception is, uh, the, you know, camera on a, on a iPhone. So it's a whole different uh, perception of what reality could be, or at least an attempt at capturing a certain kind of reality. In any event, I think um, uh, we had a television uh, in 1948, and there were these Italian films shown once a week on Friday night for the Italian American community in New York. There were three local channels, and um, we saw the new realist films. And I could not, I, I was five or six, and uh, for me, the, uh, the look of the films and that grainy black and white TV and uh, subtitle and that sort of thing. Uh, it didn't seem, that, I know it was still cinema. I know that uh, Wizard of Oz on its re-release that I saw, Duel in the Sun, uh, you know, uh, Whispering Smith with Alan Wayne. That was cinema, and this was cinema too. But it had another immediacy to it. And adding to that was the fact that the people in the film, particularly Paisa, the Rossellini film that begins in Sicily, but my grandparents came to me the apartment and watching it with my family and um, what they were saying, how they were speaking in the film was the way they were speaking. So somehow it's connected to all of it through that film. And I guess that stayed in my, in my mind that way. Um, but ultimately, uh, um, there, I could not really see a difference between the two. You see? Uh, and then of course we became, uh, I think, uh, very, very aware of the nonfiction film in the 50s, and particularly films from the WPA. Yeah. Leo Hurwitz and 
Berlin Rats and all of that. So uh, that became something. And we could see there was a theater in New York called uh, The Thalia, uh, 90 something street. The first you had to get up there. <laughs> really downtown. So, and the theater was very small and the screen was tiny and it was uh, no nonsense. Every day in the summer they had double build, every day they changed it. And we saw many uh, documentaries there. Hymn of the Nations, Hymn to the Nations, Tuscany, that was quite, quite extraordinary. Um, uh, suddenly, the first time I ever saw an Eisenstein film, just walked in the middle, you know? And so, um, this led to um, the, the uh, awareness, particularly, of uh, this kind of filmmaking when I started taking film courses at NYU in 1960. But by that time, there's Penny Baker, there's uh, Leacock, there's the Maisels, and Shirley Clark, and John Cassavetes, and Shadows, and Shadows, and, and Cassavetes, uh, I mean, uh, Shirley uh, Clark's a cool world. There was like no difference between what I saw on that television and what I saw in the movie theaters. All one, and it could be done. You see, so in a sense, they're interrelated so much that once I saw Shadows, um, even though, um, it's another world for me, and uh, a different uh, culturally. I was very, very much uh, coming from a little kind of Sicilian village in a way. Uh, but when I saw Shadows, I told my friends that night, I said, There's no more excuses. You can do it. Depends on what you have to say. You know? So we started doing everything we could, even if we didn't have anything to say. Just, <laughs> you know? But we knew that the pictures could be made, and the documentary element was there all the time. Uh, our teacher, Hayden Nugent, at, 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 it wasn't the School of the Arts then, it was a couple of classes, it was not like NYU now, but he was only intent on showing us or helping us or not showing us, but um, inspiring us to make documentaries. Uh, anybody who made uh, narrative films in 1959 or 60, that was out here in the West Coast. There was very little in New York, um, independent. Were you uh, resistant to that idea, or were well, you, because I think you also said that you were more interested in making sort of more stylized narrative films at the time. Oh, absolutely, yeah, but the thing was that, huh, um, it seemed that one could, how should we put it, it should be a film, it shouldn't be a documentary or a fiction film, it should be a film. There should be no difference. I mean, and that is happening now, too. There is no, really shouldn't be pigeonholed into it and say, well, the documentary should be this way, and that's nonfiction. What if it's all together? What if you could pull from everything and experiment with it, you see? And that was the idea that uh, ultimately became Mean Streets, really. spending the time and effort to make a feature documentary, or even a short or part of a series about it. Well, I think the, the, the one, the key one was Italian-American, the one I made about my mother and father, but that was, uh, that was, we kind of wanted criteria finally soon, but um, uh, in a case like that, it was 1976, it was the Bicentennial, and they asked, I was asked if I would do one, uh, they were doing a PBS series, I think, at that time, uh, W A T in New York, um, Storm of Strangers it was called, and they had for each ethnic group um, a, a half hour film. And they asked me to do the Italian one, and I suggested that instead of doing the traditional or conventional, I should say, uh, chronological, uh, uh, kind of uh, obvious way of going about uh, uh, explaining this whole business of the immigration and the Italians, so why don't we just go to my mother and father's apartment on Elizabeth Street, we'll have dinner. I'll ask them these questions, my friend Martin Martin and I come up with the questions, you know. And my mother thought by that point that we used to be, you have to understand, was, that they were, you know, they never went to school, they were working in the garment district, but their kids started to make these movies, they thought I was completely crazy, you know? But they, they participated because their son is doing it. And so um, uh, we got in there, 
But myself, and like a few of the kids from NYU, and Mark and I, and, we, uh, and I started shooting. Uh, I was about to ask a question, but I saw that my mother uh, took over the scene. <laughs> and my father was re resistant, and she started arguing with him, and then, and you know, by the time, by the time I, I uh, finished, which was the next day, I shot three hours one day, three hours the next, uh, as eating with them at the table. Um, by that time, I realized, um, well, first of all, I realized that they had a whole life before me. <laughs> wow, man. I didn't realize what it was really like in the tenements in 1922, you know? Um, in any event, all the questions we had didn't really matter anymore. They just took off and went and went and went. And then I began to realize that the, um, as much as style that I, I'm fascinated by Fellini and Hofuls and Kubrick and um, Eisenstein, all of the editing. When a person is in the frame, directly talking to you or directly to the camera, that's the movie. And I, part of that also came from watching the portrait of Jason, Sherry Clark. For like two hours, this guy's up there. I don't know if he's telling it's true or not. I don't know what it was, but it was really powerful. My thought. Um, and that then affected everything I did in the fiction films too, including the film The Irishman. Uh, I know that if the actor could hold it, and if it's interesting enough, um, he, he, he just stay on them, he or she, you know. Um, and so that was a very special thing. And then I started making documentaries for every film I made, like a companion day with Taxi Driver was a film I made called American Boy on a, a friend like Steve Prince. Um, in New York, New York was uh, Last Waltz. And by that point, the music, of course, music was something that, uh, because I, uh, again, uh, the family uh, wasn't in the habit of reading and everything was visual, but there was music all the time. All kinds of music, opera, some symphonic music here and there, but primarily uh, jazz and, and swing and popular music. But uh, the most important music I remember was Django Reinhardt and the Hot Club of France. And I had, I'm telling you, I was five years old, I don't know what that sound was, but I played those 78s at Steppenberg Pally. I still see images in my head as if Stan Brackage did them or something. <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but that impulse, music, always creates for me the impulse to shoot, uh, to compose and design a scene, always. And so Wes Waltz was like a natural. I had worked a little bit, I worked on Woodstock too stage and um, in the editing. Um, so we were very aware of this, and music was just a major uh, part of my life, and it's always, it's always influenced, uh, you know, in the Irishman's uh, the Five Satins and the Still of the Night. That's it. That's the movie, in a way. Um, and that's, the, as soon as I read the book, I said, that's it, that's the song. And then from there, we went, and Brian Robertson came in and did other stuff, but but uh, primarily, it's it's uh, like the Street. So, uh, and so, be my baby. It's, it's the Ronettes, it's Bill Spector, it's the Wall of Sound, and then there's uh, the Stones, of course. And, uh, so, so in a way, um, music has always been uh, uh, a great inspiration. Uh, it's something I always turn to. That's why I was glad I got here and heard the best couple of songs. You know? But, <laughs> but in any event, um, uh, Robbie and those guys got me involved in West Waltz, and so at that point. Um, I don't know how it happened, but oh yeah, I think eventually, um, eventually, uh, I, I did something called Nothing But the Blues with uh, Eric Clapton. And it was just an interview. And uh, I was cutting away, I was helping uh, make this, I think it was a PBS thing. That was about 20 years ago. And I was cutting to some of the great blues musicians, uh, uh, Money Waters and uh, you know, Sonny Boyd Williams and that sort of thing. And, uh, Eric uh, Clapton felt that was really a problem because he says, I can't be equal to them. And to us, it's like a joke, you know, so it's British blues, so what? It's different, but it's, you know. And so at that point, we decided to do something, we were able to still retain some of that. But at that point, I realized, yeah, I understand what he means. It was like, people say, oh, you're a master. I said, I know what a master is. I've seen all the pictures. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Something's off, you know. But 
it, you know, it's the, 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 the truth wrapped in lies, you know, that's the idea, you know. I want to ask you if that's connected at all to the approach to shooting or working with Dylan. Because I just find he's obviously a very mercurial person. He's involved in this constant recreation of himself. I was looking back at the review, Janet Aslan's review of Ronaldo Clara, which is of the same time, described him as being a man at war with his mask. Well, and masks, yeah. Yeah, and, and so I'm just wondering if this sort of uh, conjuring fantastical approach helped you get at something with him, because well, he's hard to pin down. Yeah, I mean, why pin him down, first of all? Because I mean to be, but why? I don't even want to know who you listen to the music. Watch it. Go with it. You know? Something you did 40 years ago is still here. It's still here in your heart, too. Uh, so go with that. People want to know. Just experience it. That was the idea. I, the masks, man, the masks are something. He did, yeah, what was all that, those masks? And then he says in the interview, there weren't enough masks. <laughs> I was a little laughing. Because I, I wasn't in that interview. I was a Jeff did that. And, um, and David and uh, Ellen Curris and Margaret Bodie, they were all there in LA, and I couldn't, I was doing the Irishman thing, so. Then um, he says, uh, so and so wanted to sing a song with me, and, and somebody else wanted to sing a song. He says, I didn't see the point of it, really. I mean, the church movie. <laughs> I don't know what was coming, what was, what was going to come out of him next in this stuff. Um, that's why I put, that's why he, we had written some stuff for him to say, which I didn't really uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of agree with, or, or just to get him started. And Jeff is very good at these interviews. But they know each other 40 years, it's a different kind of thing, you know. And you see what happens there, because at one point he's talking, He's talking about how the Roman Thunder thing started, and he goes, oh, this is all bullshit, you know. <laughs> and I guess, so let's use that. Let's use it, because um, he said, I don't, mean, I don't have a clue. I wasn't even born then. <laughs> okay. Um, and I said, okay, let's go with that. That also opens it up to a kind of improvisatory, intuitive way of moving with the, with the structure of the piece, like a piece of music, rather than um, a narrative structure. I don't know where they started. I guess they started at Plymouth. Yeah. And they wound up where? I, then I understand there was a second part to the tour. That's not important. I said, just let's get the spirit of that. And uh, ultimately, he does say something interesting towards the end. He said, what's left of it? Nothing, ashes. And I said, really? You know? Uh, and I asked Jeff, what do you mean? And he said, well, he thinks it's Basically, that all those factors that created the 70s at that point will never happen again. And that is ashes, they come on. I said, yeah, but, so I said, yeah, but we put that right before knocking on heaven's door, ending with Alan um, Ginsburg, um, with his speech, um, which I feel that from the ashes, you know, like the phoenix arises again, you see. And so, uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the cameraman, I had the cameras reflected in the window of uh, Ginsburg when he was doing that uh, you know, wonderful uh, benediction at the end. Um, is Dylan? I can see him in the window. He's the <laughs> so all of these things come together. You know, there was so much so enjoyment. But I don't. I, I know what he means. Ashes, dust, nothing. You know. Um, there's this uh, uh, in Rome. The, one of the churches has a tombstone on the outside of um, uh, the uh, Capuchin monks from the 16th century. I think one named Bernini or Bernardini, I think. And, and I remember reading it was in Latin, uh, but I'll say it in English. <laughs> uh, it was here lies, uh, here lies ashes, dust. what it is, that remind me of that. Wow, you know, so he's going there, you see. And you can, yeah, he knock on heaven's door is the perfect song for it. I thought, well, maybe it's too much, the idea. It comes from uh, Pat Garrett with uh, Slim Pickens dying, I said. But the way it's performed, and him and 
Roger again. It's so, so moving, I thought, with such power uh, that it seemed to really work. question, which is sort of a variation of what I just asked, which is uh, a lot of people talk about uh, sort of various ideas of uh, combining things that are true and untrue to reach a sort of greater truth. Uh, was that at all part of the idea of this, or was it just about being playful? No, I wish I could be that uh, clear intellectually, but I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I gotta say, for me, always because of listening to music and then seeing people perform, uh, the truth is, for me, in the music. It is in the music, and you can say, or do anything you want. You can describe it, you can say this means this or that, doesn't it? It's, it's I think, um, something could be written one way, but it could mean something else entirely to you at the age of 21, and at the age of 40, it means something different. And so what's that elusive uh, nature of art, you know? Um, uh, here, we wanted to have, yeah, he's like, that's why it's the joker with the mask, in a sense, the uh, man being and waving, um, the idea of uh, masks and um, uh, peril, you know, les enfants de paradis, what he says. You see uh, John Weaver up there with that white face. Um, in, in a sense, the uh, um, real feeling of a traveling um, uh, committed to which was very joyous. I do remember in Lower East Side in 1950, um, in the tenements, I remember hearing um, a guy playing guitar and somebody singing. We look out the window, there were still traveling, uh, uh, strolling musicians. And my grandmother was going to throw money down. Yeah. And that's New York. So you can imagine the villages and outside of the big cities. But that's, it's just wonderful to you know, experience life with that. And so for me, I don't know about a, a great truth. I, I just went to the heart of the music I thought. Yeah, I, I think you got there. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I want to go back a little bit to your little well, question. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, but then she, then she came and told me I'm not here. So I'm not here. 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 I'm not talk about why you did that for those in, in, Give me an example, though, I don't remember. Uh, well, like, the George Harrison movie starts off with footage oh, of World yeah, War II, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, it was interesting to me to understand, uh, because at the age of 13, I heard, um, you know, uh, Mabel and uh, uh, Tutti Frutti, and, and of course, uh, uh, Don't Be Cruel, I believe it was, and uh, All Shook Up, Presley. And so the change was right there. I experienced that. Um, we, of course, had a different experience. I mean, we had a very different experience from young boys and girls growing up in England, post blitz and the stringent uh, uh, post war nature of England and the great changes in that country and its uh, ultimate demise of the empire. And so um, I was fascinated by the idea that these kids come out of there and they don't want to hear about them. They hear this music coming from America, and um, they, they, they change it completely. They take a whole way to it, so I didn't understand that at first. I just thought it was picked up uh, uh, over the air, so to speak. But it was really a, a, a major cultural change for that generation, and the difficulties it caused um, with the conservative, uh, the conservative uh, government, the conservative society, the culture, and that, that incredible uh, that fracture, in a way. And the music brought that about, I believe. Um, and so um, I like that context. I like that, and, and the tragedy, the tragedy of the Blitz, the tragedy that 
touch this beautiful piece of music, you know, and then you see finally it all come out of the place. I believe she had told me, I think it's in a book, that um, his mother, suffering during one of the Blitz uh, uh, bombings, had him under a table in the kitchen, and it was so intense, she looked up and she saw a vision of the Virgin Mary. And we wanted to get there, we didn't quite have it, but, but this was something that come out of the, 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 the I, can't, I can't express it, but what, what, you, uh, what you experience with this such extraordinary trauma. And then out of that comes the music. How do you decide when you're going to be in visible or audible in your films? I mean, I'm thinking about American Boy from like being in the hot tub to Rolling Thunder where um, you're using or No Direction Home where you're not present at the interview. No, but I did, I do a couple of voiceovers, I think. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't quite a minute no. No, and the, the American boy is interesting because uh, of the dark, the dark um, nature of Taxi Driver. Uh, at the same time, I was very much involved with uh, stand-up comics and uh, uh, in California, New York, basically in California, and so in Los Angeles. and. Um, they were all nighters. All nighters. Somebody would arrive, somebody would come in and do all kinds of ridiculous things. Uh, 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 extraordinary people happened for Christmas, Albert Brooks there, Rob Reiner, uh, <coughs> Marshall, uh, Dick Gregory, and all kinds of these guys' house in the film. Yeah. yeah. They'd all just show up, and incredible things would go on, and David Steinberg. And so um, uh, that again was the storyteller, the one, the stand up, you know. And, only this was a dark stand-up, and uh, the drugs involved, uh, and that was almost like, I guess it was like um, uh, chronicling or, or trying to capture um, a very bad time, really, uh, a kind of descent in a way, which did end in a very bad, bad way. Uh, and came out the other side from Raging Bull, but that was the beginning of it. Um, but it had to do with comedy. <laughs> it had to do with comedy, yeah. Well, and now they're giving me the time to stop the signal. But I don't oh, know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank you so thank much you. for coming. Thank you. Thank you.